are kicking off our second session of the Hop and Brew School uh, with a Hop Sensory Training. And we have Tiffany Petra and Tessa Shalati of our sensory team. Thank you both. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Tony Lynn. Let's make sure this works. All right. So just to let you know, uh, today we're going to start out with a presentation and then we'll jump into the uh, Hop Sensory Assessment at the end. Um, just before we get started, if you have your sample packs that were mailed to you, you can bring them out of the freezer now. Uh, we'll let them warm up a little bit so they're ready to smell in about 25 minutes. Um, and you were also given some instructions to download sample ox. That is actually how we're going to perform our sensory assessment. So if you haven't already, uh, try to download that app on your phone and uh, you'll have a join code and you'll also just be able to see it on the front page. So that's the best way to make this as interactive as possible since we can't all be sitting in the same room together. So we're gonna start out with a few introductions, uh, talk about why you should evaluate hops. I'll go through a few different hop sensory analysis methods and then Tessa will review our hop and beer lexicon, the language we're gonna to use to talk about samples. And then, as I mentioned before, we'll dive into that interactive uh, sensory exercise. So. Uh, to start off, my name is Tiffany Petra, and we are coming to you live from the Aroma Dome. So this is our sensory lab here. Uh, I am the sensory manager at Yakima Chief Hops, and as the name suggests, I just manage our sensory program. So I have with me Tessa. Hi, I'm Tessa. I'm the sensory and brewing scientist here at Yakima Chief Hops. Um, so I kind of focus a little bit more on the beer sensory side of our research and development program. Um, and, but I work with a lot of hops as well, a lot of beer, as you might expect. Um, we are excited to actually have two friends from Single Hill Brewing that are going to uh, join us during the assessments and uh, let us know kind of from the, the brewer, uh, you know, brewers with boots on the ground, uh, their perspective on all these hops are gonna smell together. So I'll um, let Andrew and Tristan introduce themselves. Hi, uh, I'm Andrew, uh, Andrew Pytel. Uh, I'm the customer experience director at Single Hill. Uh, and with me is... <clears throat> I'm, my name is Tristan. I'm the lead brewer here at Single Hill Brewing. Awesome. I'm both happy to be here. And we're coming live from the patio on a sunny morning. Yeah, it's great. It might be Lovely. Some yeah, you guys, you guys look like you've got a pretty good spot there. It's pretty comfy. It's all right. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's get started. Uh, of course, a part of our introductions is that we always want to review our mission, vision, and values at Yakima Chief. Uh, this will just help, I don't know, set the tone for, for the rest of our session today. But our mission is truly to connect family hop farms with the world's finest brewers. And one great way to do that is to actually smell our amazing product together. So we hope that by involving brewers and home brewers and consumers uh, to smell the amazing hops that our uh, growers have, have grown, uh, it will all connect us um, closer together and we'll be able to um, help brewers in their goals and help growers in theirs as well. You can also see our vision and our values there. Our values, passion, respect, integrity, dedication, and excellence. They spell pride. Uh, and that's just something that we talk about every day um, in, our, in our work. So for those of you who aren't as familiar with Yakima Chief Hops, feel free to check out our website and you can see what we're all about. Of course, Tessa and I are here. Uh, we are representing our amazing team and I just wanted to give them a shout out as well. So we have Kevin Coles on the left there. He is our sensory technician. And then we have Tommy Yancone on the right and he is our R&D data analyst and now supervises our QC sensory panel. So we have, I think we have the best team in the world um, and I just want to give them a shout out before we get started. Our sensory analysis program uh, is truly a multifaceted um, approach. We're trying to support different areas of the company. And we do that through a bunch of different ways. So we're going to support our hop growers by assessing every single lot that's delivered to us through Harvest, uh, giving them real-time sensory feedback on how their lots performed. We're also going to design some specific field trials and help them see how their cultivation practices and harvest practices impact the perceived aroma and flavor from their hops. We're going to support our sales team by providing them with uh, information about new products, new varieties. We also uh, give them lot specific sensory data so that they can start to match their brewing customers with the best lot of hops for their needs. Of course, there are a lot of research uh, initiatives going on in the industry and we wanna be involved. So any universities or trade organizations, 
that have trials going on, we want to be a part of that because if they benefit growers in the Pacific Northwest or brewers around the world, we, we want to be a part and, and it's for the good of the industry. And then we are closely entwined with our quality department, of course, as I mentioned, you know, assessing hop lots as they come in, but then it's really important after those are taken into our inventory and we further process them to assess them throughout that production and make sure that they are the highest quality so that the, the amazing citra that we received at harvest maintains that high quality throughout the entire process. And then a pretty fun part of our job, and we'll start doing these uh, plot walks this next weekend, but working with Yakima Chief Ranches and Hop Breeding Company to actually assess and give feedback on new accessions and decide, you know, which ones might be the, ne the next new variety. So Great. I just wanted to say, <laughs> I always, we always refer to this photo of our team as our band photo. Um, and I just wanted to point out that we think we look really cool here. Um, and we hope that you also think we look as cool as we feel in this photo. I'm really glad we, we I had to put that. Yeah, it was really important. <laughs> Perfect. So let's just get into it. Uh, why do we think you should evaluate hops? I mean, it's what we do all the time, but uh, we'll talk a little bit more. You know, regardless of or, you know, the size of your brewery or program, uh, assessing your raw materials is actually going to um, help you with a lot of different brewing initiatives. So first, it's going to serve as a quality assurance. Um, and you're going to be able to track the uh, slight variability between growing years. Uh, you might be able to see, um, you know, I guess for recipe development, substitutions or replacements, say there's a variety shortage or you're not quite a hop variety is phasing out or something and you need to bulk it up with something you have on hand. By ass assessing everything you have in your inventory, you're going to be able to make more knowledgeable uh, substitutions and replacements on, on a brew day. Um, it's also going to help you improve communication with your vendors. So, uh, you know, an example might be our, one of our core brands is a Pacific Northwest IPA, a Northwest IPA. It's really piney and citrusy, and its, it's key variety is Simcoe. So we're really looking to procure a Simcoe that has pithy grapefruit and piney aromas. Let's see those on the table for selection. Uh, training is another, uh, this is another opportunity to um, evaluate hops and bring your team together. So we do this all the time with our team at Yakima Chief Hops. There's a lot of people who wouldn't normally come into contact with hops on a day-to-day on -day basis. You know, they're uh, crunching the numbers in finance or doing some cool coding in IT and they don't really have, have the time or, or really a reason to go and smell hops every day. But by pulling them in and talking about the different brands, having them smell samples together, they can now feel knowledgeable about our product and excited about it. Uh, this is gonna be the same thing with your, your taproom staff or, or others who don't necessarily smell hops every day. Uh, educating them about what hops are actually in the beer, how they perform in your beers is going to make them more knowledgeable when they're out selling your, selling your beer. Uh, and customers these days, the beer drinking consumers are becoming more and more knowledgeable. They're asking uh, you know, about different beer styles. They're asking for specific hops in beer. So, uh, we don't want to, we want to always want to be ahead of them and to be really knowledgeable and back, back the beers and back the hops. Um, and, you know, another thing, if you are able to get your hands on some of the experimental varieties, you know, hop breeders are trying to target a lot of different objectives. You know, they're looking for high yield, disease and pest resistance. Maybe they're targeting a high alpha or a specific novel aroma. Um, this feedback that you can provide to a hop breeder might actually have a big impact on you know, deciding what is the next big hop. So um, we always encourage you to smell your hops. Oops. So some different hop analysis methods. I'm sure most of you have heard of the traditional hop hand rub. Uh, this one is, uh, you know, probably the most commonly used uh, assessment method. Um, it is really easy to set up, but it's very messy to clean up. Um, however, it's considered the industry standard when it comes to hop selection. So traditionally, Brewers stood around a table and they would um, usually just use this uh, hand rub method to assess the hop quality for the year and to see, you know, in general how the year was. But now brewers are starting to assess and look for the more nuanced aromas in hop samples. So um, this is a pretty easy method to do, but you're essentially just going to grab a few hop cones, rub them between your hands to rupture those lupulin glands, fluff them, and then take a sniff. Um, a great advantage to this assessment method is that it gives you the opportunity to um, perform visual and tactile inspection on the hops as well, so to look for other quality parameters. Uh, visually, you can try to look for 
you know, how green is the sample? Is there any disease or pest damage? Uh, does it have the, you know, this is a high alpha variety, so I should probably see a lot of lupulin and oils. Does it have that in there? Um, tactile, you can actually, when you're rubbing the hops, see or picking them up, it has it been properly dried. So if the sample is under dried, you'll pick up the sample and it'll shatter immediately. There won't be any intact cones, it'll kind of look like dust and you might even start to get some cheesy aromas. Uh, if the sample is actually, uh, well, that was over dried and if it's under dried, it'll be really hard to break up. So it'll just kind of, uh, you'll try to use the hand rub method but it just won't go away. When we stick it in the blender, the cone just spins around in the, in the blender. So. Um, that's a cue that it hasn't been properly dried and that the string is still holding too much moisture. And you might start to actually get some of those musty, moldy, uh, mildew aromas as well. Anything that's perfectly dried should be pretty, you know, slightly springy to the touch, um, should have lots of intact cones, and uh, you shouldn't see too much disease or pest uh, pressure. Uh, one limitation of this is that uh, you actually, it's a really hard method to do with pellets. So uh, we have a solution for that on the next slide, but um, some disadvantage for this also, you know, beware of the lupulin buildup on your hands. You're going to get that aroma carryover. It's pretty fatiguing and it's not very standardized, but uh, you can still use this method if it's what you have access to, if it's, if it works well with your program. Uh, just try to use tools like alcohol wipes in between to make sure you're, you're getting that lupulin off in between samples um, and, you know, maybe smelling moist towelettes in between to make sure that you don't get too tired. So as I mentioned, the hand rub method is not extremely standardized. Uh, the ASBC wanted to answer that. Um, so that in 2018, they published the ASBC hop grain sensory evaluation method. And this is also a pretty high throughput, um, easy method to accomplish. You really only need a, you know, some type of blade grinder and your hop samples and then a jar to put the sample in. So you know, really way out of standardized amount of hops, grind it until you get a uniform powder pour that into, the, into a jar and then assess the sample. Um, you know, we always recommend as, as samples are ground, they will start to oxidize. Uh, so you'll start to get cheesy aromas after an amount of time. Try to assess them as soon as possible, but if you can't, you know, we assess our, our samples throughout the day. So we just stick them in the freezer and make sure they're sealed up uh, so they don't have uh, severe oxidation by the time we smell them. Um, this is you know, super manageable sample prep. It's standardized. Uh, we like it. We, uh, we use it every single day. And I think, I guess, last harvest, we ground over 8,500 samples just during harvest. So we're pretty familiar with this method. If you have any questions about it, you can ask us or you can go to the ASBC methods of analysis page and find out more details. Uh, one disadvantage of this one is that you can't really perform the uh, visual assessment because you've ground the sample already. Um, it can also be pretty fatiguing. So. And then of course, you know, smelling a hop only tells you so much, right? What really matters is how it's gonna taste in a beer or how it will perform in a beer. So it doesn't have to be super complicated in how you design uh, your experiment, but it's gonna you know, depend on your capacity and your equipment. Um, so a way to see how hops are going to perform in beer is to actually just replace a variety in a standard recipe. This should be a recipe, a beer that you brew consistently and you, you've demonstrated that there isn't too much batch to batch uh, variation. Uh, you wanna brew both of the, the test and the control around at the same time so that aging is not another variable that you're assessing. And then you wanna evaluate them next to each other. So you can just see what did that variety substitution actually do? How did it impact our, our core brand? Um, you know, single hop beers are sometimes seen as one dimensional and that's super exciting, but you know, it can be a really great way to see how a hop is going to perform in beer without the noise of anything else. And then you could also do a split batch for dry hop trials, which is something we do pretty regularly, um, especially with all these new hop varieties coming out of the breeding program. We want to um, just brew one beer, split it a bunch of different ways and just dry hop and see which ones truly shine, uh, which ones are kind of duds. Uh, as I mentioned, there are thousands of hop varieties that are getting released every year or bred every year. So we need to, um, screen them out as quickly as possible. Um, and using a basic grain bill to let the hop shine is really gonna help us um, assess these a lot better. So um, yeah, I think you know, smell and taste your hops before doing anything with them. Uh, but I will have Tessa talk about how to talk about uh, standardized language when assessing hop. Yes, we're gonna talk about how to talk about it. So 
you know, Tiffany just went over all these methods for preparing your sample. You have a sample in front of you, be it, uh, you know, hop cones, ground pellets, um, a, a trial beer that you're testing the hops in. Um, and it might be really tempting to just dive right in and start uh, shooting off descriptors, um, which is a good kind of way to get started. But in order to really, um, you know, formalize and standardize your assessments, you are going to need to settle on a lexicon, um, which has a lot of advantages that we will talk about. Um, so to have a lexicon, you have to first develop a lexicon. Um, what is a lexicon? It's a vocabulary of a person, language, or branch of knowledge. So it's, it's just a, you know, it's your, your group of words that you're all agreeing to, to use and to use them in the same way, which is um, actually the biggest part of it. Um, so best practices is to develop your lexicon by, um, by exposing a group of people to kind of the full range of that product. So, um, you know, if, if you were developing a lexicon for apples, for example, you'd want to get your Granny Smiths, you'd want to get your Pink Ladies, your Cosmic Crisps, all of these, and you would come up with all the words you could use to describe all of the apples in the world. Um, and we do the same thing or did the same thing with um, the pop. So smelling, you know, every possible variety from every possible growing region. What is this like big bin of words that we can use? And uh, breweries can do this as well with the hops that you're going to be using in your brewery. And basically you're gonna whittle it down from there. You know, you don't want a lexicon that has a million terms on it. So what things are kind of describing um, something similar? Can we, can we fuse those together? Um, what things are pretty rare and we probably don't, you know, we maybe only will use once every decade. Yeah, we probably kick that off the lexicon. Um, the, the key is that these need to be very distinct and universally understood terms. So we talk a lot about, um, I feel like this is the quintessential example, and I'm not sure if this is like someone said this once or if we just came up with this, but like grandma's house, I feel like people have a lot of like memories from childhood that they bring up during sensory because sensory is so closely tied to memory. Uh, people will say, oh, it's, this smells like my grandma's house. And so you know, my grandma's house probably smelled different than your grandma's house and everyone's grandma's house. Um, so, you know, what is it? Is it, was your grandma baking cookies? Is it, is it cinnamon from the snickerdoodles your grandma always made? Or did she wear a really strong rose scented perfume that, you know, made the whole house very aromatic? Um, we have to drill down and actually find the terms that we all can like universally understand. Um, and another example we give a lot is, um, Dank is like our nightmare term because we like whenever we hear people use the term dank to describe hop samples, they're almost always using it in like one of five possible different ways. Um, so to solve this problem from, you know, within our lexicon, we, um, you know, made a clear definition. So some people say onion garlic, some people say like, a, a, you know, kind of a um, musty basement or something. Well, we already had onion garlic on our lexicon and we already had musty on our lexicon. So we define dank as a cannabis-like aroma. And then um, another key part is we trained with reference standards. So we would put a little piece of hemp extract in a vial and say, this is what dank means to our group. So when we as a collective use this term, this thing in my hand is what we're talking about. And we'll use onion garlic to describe that. And we'll use musty to describe um, that other thing. So there's no confusion over, you know, how a term is, is being used and what is being um, meant by it. And so, yeah, we, we talk a lot about how important a lexicon is. Um, we spent a lot of time in the last year developing um, and kind of expanding and improving our lexicon. Um, it pretty closely aligns with the ASBC lexicon, just to make sure that we're also aligning with the industry as a whole. You know, it's important to align with your group that you're assessing with, but it's also really important for that language to also be understandable, like outside of your group. So um, that's why we, you know, based ours off of the ASBC um, lexicon, because we knew that that would mean that no matter where we were, um, we would be using the same terms in the same way. So without further ado, um, this is our beautiful new lexicon, uh, put like made beautiful by our. Uh, our graphic design specialist, but um, as you can see, it's it's quite you know organized. So we have these parent aromas, these bigger um, categories, and then we break it down into smaller categories you know, within those bigger categories. Um, it's not always super easy to um, stick things in these categories. We 
you know, go back and forth about does this, um, you know, subterm belong in this one or this one, what's more intuitive, what makes more sense chemically. Um, it's an existential crisis that we deal with on a regular basis. Um, but in general, this is, uh, I think, a pretty good um, representation of how flavor um, is exhibited in both hops and beer um, and is pretty intuitive to, to navigate. Uh, we're going to use sample ox in a little bit. It's very, very similar to this, the lexicon within the app, because theirs is also based on the same ASPC um, sensory lexicon, which again is another advantage of um, having a lexicon that is understood by, by the whole industry. And this is available to download at our website. So if you want to use this as a tool moving forward, please feel free to go there and export it and print it out. Yeah, yeah, good to have, good to have on hand. So I mentioned a little bit about reference standards earlier, and I just want to drill down a little bit because I do feel like it's um, a pretty major key in training a uh, burgeoning sensory panel on, on a lexicon. Um, you know, a reference standard is just a sort of a, an encapsulation of that term. So, uh, you know, for example, lemon, we use a lemon essential oil. And so we put it in a little vial and we say, this is lemon. When you say lemon, this is what you mean. This is what we all mean when we say lemon. And we try to come up with as many as possible for the like 88 terms on our lexicon or something. You know, it's not always possible, but we actually have most of them uh, in reference standard form. And um, the reason that there's a traffic light on this uh, photo is because Tiffany has a really good analogy that I steal from her uh, every chance I get, which is it when you smell, when you smell an aroma, uh, we kind of want you to train to the point where it's like when you see a red light when you're driving, your foot goes on to the brake. Like you don't have to think about it. You don't say, oh, that's a red light. What do I do? And there's a red light. Ah, oh, yes, of course, I slow down and stop my car. Uh, we want it to be that automatic. So when you smell that lemon reference standard so many times, when you're confronted with a, a hop or a beer sample uh, and it's lemony, you don't have to say, what's that aroma? Uh, it's kind of bright. Uh, what is that? You just go at lemon, write it down on the ballot, move on. Um, and that's really powerful. But, you know, obviously we understand that not everyone has access to a you know, reference standard kit of 80 different aromas. So um, there's a lot of things you can do that have a really similar impact that are a little bit less like intense. Um, you know, I mean, it's really just about paying attention to uh, you know, your meals or that glass of wine, or you know, as long as you are turning your brain on and really thinking about flavor and aroma as you go about your daily life, you are going to become better at sensory. It's that practice of matching that term with the, with the experience um, that you just have to train. And uh, it's fun to do you know, with a friend. Uh, we have done a lot of uh, challenges with our panelists, especially during lockdown when we couldn't train them. We called it sniffer savvy and I'd send out like a prompt. It was like pull six spices out of your cupboard and smell them and describe how they're different from each other and how they're similar or like, go find, um, you know, a, a handful of different flowers in your garden or whatever or out in the park and smell through the different flowers and write down, you know, how they're all floral, yes, but how are these different flowers different from each other? And what's your cue to kind of remember that, um, that you know, that this specific characteristic means lilac, whereas this specific character means rose or whatever. Um, so it's something that anyone can do, um, and it will make you better. And people are often like, I don't have a lot of experience with sensory, but you actually do. You eat food and drink beverages every day. So just switch that little part of your brain on a little bit more often, and you'll, you'll get a lot better with it. So all that being said, I think we're ready to assess some samples. Um, we have ours pre-prepared because we are uh, spoiled sensory scientists and uh, we, we, this is what we do all day. So uh, please go ahead and get your samples uh, opened up and, and get into the Sample Ox app. That's the uh, next step for this. So um, pull out your phones, your tablets, whatever, pull up the Sample Ox app. Um, our event, the um, 2021 Hop and Brew School Sensory Training should be like right at the top when you open the app. Um, if you don't see that, you can enter this join code, 83E7T, yeah, that thing on the screen. Um, go ahead and open that up. And just to 
to go through kind of how to use this app quickly. Um, so you, once you are into our event, you can um, click on the sample. Did we go really dark? Not a lot we can do about it. This <laughs> We're gonna adjust our lighting, I guess. That's funny. Nothing changed. Oh well. No, I'll stay. I shouldn't have looked directly into the light bulb. That's the only thing. Weird. Why are we dark? Oh well. Um, <laughs> so basically, you're going to click on the, the the name of the sample that you're about to assess. So, for example, Atanum. And once you open it up, you'll basically see um, it'll ask you to rate how much you like the sample. So, kind of a preference um, hedonic test to to see how much you just gut check like it. Um, so you can slide that little thing across and choose the smiley face that best represents your experience with that, that hop just uh, in the, you know, your first reaction. Uh, and then as you scroll down, you'll be able to go into the aroma section. And it, it basically looks pretty similar to the lexicon I just showed you where you can, um, you know, click on through the different um, kind of major categories. Um, you know, you'll see citrus. You can click just citrus. Um, and then if you detect citrus, you could also drill down and go a little bit more specific uh, within that citrus category, checking things like grapefruit and lime and lemon and stuff. And if you do want to check something like grapefruit or lime or lemon, um, oh, we're back in the light again for literally no discernible reason. Um, if you want to check one of those like minor characteristics like citrus or grapefruit or orange, make sure you also check the parent aroma or the bigger category. Um, this will just help us see where we're aligning a little bit better. Um, because once we've all assessed the sample, um, we'll be able to go through to the next page and um, see how our individual assessments align uh, with the group. So, shall we? So we have ours pre-ground. Uh, if you have a little spice grinder, you could try grinding your sample up in that. Or, you know, a trick we'll do sometimes is just open the bag and set it on a flat surface uh, and then use a hammer or a rolling pin or something. Brute force. Yeah, try to smash it and, and just break open those pellets a little bit to release more aroma. They should have warmed up by now to kind of room temperature, so we should be primed for smelling. Um, but go ahead and prep your sample and then start snipping. And uh, Tony Lynn, if you see any um, questions come through about how to assess the sample or whatever, please feel free to chime in and read those out to us. And Andrew and Tristan, we'd love to have you back so we can see you smelling hops and <laughs> join us. And we'll maybe try to refrain from talking about it too much until everyone at home has been able to uh, submit their assessments so we don't bias anyone because uh, we're you know, trying to be purists about it. Um, so yeah, everyone go ahead and tuck in, and fill out your sample box ballot. I always get so itchy this time of year. Oh no. Rubbing so many hops. Yeah. There. We have a few panelists who will wear gloves whenever they're doing the hand rub. So they've had breakouts. So be careful. <laughs> it's kind of an aggressive plant. <laughs> yeah. It's like pretty acidic and
submissions so far. Yes, yeah, so we can see how many people are submitting. So it looks like we've got eight in. We apologize for any background noise. There's literally no quiet place in the whole building. So, <laughs> hey, that's reality. <laughs> we wanted yeah, to experience. This is a pretty low alpha hop. It's only 5%. So, I always find that those are more able to travel up my nose. So, just, you know, be, be careful. I think that the technical mm -hmm. term is blasty. Yeah, blasty. Pretty blasty hop. Well, as um, people are kind of finishing up their first assessment, I just wanted to show, um, I think it's worth explaining a little bit that the page that pops up after you submit your assessment and it shows um, these different uh, bars. So basically the red bars um, are, gosh, how does it work? <laughs> the red bars are your response and then the blue bars are like the group response response that you didn't align with. So if you see a blue bar, it means the group said that pretty highly, but you didn't. Um, so a, a pretty long blue bar indicates that there was pretty big consensus uh, with the rest of the group on a term that you didn't detect. So that's a good indicator that it might be uh, worth returning to the sample and smelling it and seeing if you can kind of like see where everyone else was coming from uh, when they said that term. Like for example, I see for this tandem sample, um, grapefruit was rated by a lot of people, but I didn't put that. So my cue would be to kind of go back into the sample and be like, okay, can I see uh, where people were pulling grapefruit from? What kind of grapefruit was it? Um, and that can help me get a little bit better and more aligned with, with other people. So in the chat, feel free to tell us what you're smelling. If there's anything outside of the, the sample ox ballot you'd want to share. Yes, we love an off ballot term. <laughs> Always entertaining. What are you guys at Single Hill picking up? Uh, it's, I, it's pretty mellow for me. Um, some, I don't get a whole lot of fruit off of the tannum. I do get um, some hay, some some like kind of kind of delicate, mild potpourri aromas, um, which actually like really interests me in using it in, a, in like more like a lager style beer. Uh, if I were to, I, we haven't used the tannin before, so this is interesting to, to do this sensory on it. I, uh, I can't shake dill from this okay. um, personally, but like grapefruit also kind of like, I don't know, kind of like an aqua beef cocktail kind of thing. But um, yeah, the dill's really pervasive, which like I see that like, herbaceous people are going at, and that's sort of where I'm landing there. You know? Maybe it's just not for me. I put herbaceous as well. I didn't put anything more specific th than that, but I got hay and I think there's a pretty like woody. Yeah. No, kind of a dry wood. No. Nope. Mm -hmm. Which does, do people at home, are they using these same bags they that we are? Be, yes. Well, Try your best not to read the <laughs> tasting notes, the aroma notes on the bag before you respond. Oh. Yes, oh, there's, no. there's some yes. biasing information on that bag. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, it looks like quite a few people have responded. 23, top aromas being citrus, grapefruit, woody, herbal. And I would say that definitely aligns with what we typically get. So um, this is just an example of all the Atanum lots we've smelled over the past couple of years, uh, averaged into this graph. So you'll see we usually get, you know, a little bit of floral, but mostly like woody, grassy, herbal, specifically hay, kind of a cedar. Um, one of the funny terms that we've used during harvest before when you smell this fresh um, is actually craft store. Yes, so it's that combination of like the dried pine cones and cinnamon and that fake floral scent that just hits you when you walk into a Michael's craft store. Um, but again, I wouldn't necessarily put Michael's craft store on my ballot. I'm always going to want to try to fit it into lexicon terms as, as best as possible. So I'm going to break that down and say it's the rose, uh, the dried cedar, pine. Um, so I have to make it more accessible and the, and the data actually comes through. So 
Awesome. Well, great job, everyone. We can probably move on to Talus next. So you'll want to go back to that main page in Sample Ox and then click on the Talus sample. I always like to smell the back of my hand, something neutral in between, kind of reset. Hey, Tessa and Tiffany, we do have one question in the Q&A feature. Um, are these 2020 or 2021 hops? 21 hasn't been brought in yet. So it uh, looks like these actually might be 2019 samples. Oh. But sealed up, nitro flush, kept in cold storage. Well, that one's a little more intense. Yeah, there's a little bit more to kind of parse through. Another participant over there. Yeah, Keenan's the only way. I've always thought it'd be great to be able to train dogs to use a sensory lexicon because they're super smellers. They're super smellers. I'm becoming suspicious that everyone's just copying the <laughs> what it says on the bag. Either that or what it says on the bag is truly, truly accurate. Ten tasters. We'll probably try to target the same number as the last ones, so around 20. So, a little bit more time. Mm. I really appreciate not being mic'd while I'm smelling. <laughs> Before I've had to wear a mic, and I'm sure the person listening was mortified. <laughs> Well, TELUS is the most recently released variety out of the HBC program. Uh, what are you guys smelling over at Singleville? Have you used TELUS ever? HBC 692 would be the other. Yeah, we've actually we've used TELUS a bit. One of our uh, core IPAs is TELUS and HBC 586, um, nice. which I mean, we definitely think of it as like a strong, a, a strong uh, hop to use. So lower, lower quantity when we blend with it. But um, kind of like with the group here, it looks like I mean, pine, grapefruit, other wood a little bit, kind of cedar. Yeah, but specifically like a little down, like sweet pine, like walking into like a you know, pine forest, like, like 
kind of like springtime and other ones. Um, but also like grapefruit, some stone fruit, pear, peach, um, kind of a pretty complex hop. Uh, I find it pretty complex and certainly packs a punch when we throw it into beer, specifically in dry hop. Um, it, yeah, I, 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 I'm a big fan of Talus. And uh, we'll plan on continuing to use the hop and IPAs, hoppy beers. Every time I smell this during harvest, it just jumps off as grapefruit and really strong, like pine. Um, we always smell everything blind coated during harvest, but this is one of them that will jump off the table basically. And I'm always looking up what was that sample and the talus that was delivered last year was consistently pink grapefruit, piney, punchy. For being, you know, a kind of low mid alpha, like kind of standard um, oil profile, but it actually has huge complexity, yeah. Well, it actually does have the highest granule content of any YC cultivar, so um, something to note there, even though it has a, you know, it's not all about how much total oil is in there, it's actually what those oils are, and we know that geranium makes it into beer, it's going to be citrusy and floral, so uh, really a good thing to see. This is a graph of, you know, the last couple of years of data from HBC 692, and then again when it was named as Talus, and getting big tropical um, citrus, a little spike of woody, um, sometimes a little bit of bubble gum. But pretty awesome. I pretty much always put bubble gum for talus. Yeah. Yeah, we've. Uh, it's kind of. It has a lot of similar characteristics, like to some classic hops, um, like being like. For me, sweet pine, like kind of a citrus punch. So it's pretty versatile. We used to, when it was 692, we were using it a lot um, in mixes of different dry hops. Um, it's versatile um, and strong, and, you know, presents itself very well and yeah, blends with other hops really well. So, so yeah, definitely kind of agree with this chart. So I'm looking at it now and what I get from it. Yeah, well, that's good to hear that a small amount could go a long way. I mean, we're always looking to, you know, for economical hops that growers can grow. So if it can be a higher yield and take up less acreage, that's always gonna be a benefit. And then on the brewing side, if you can add less, but it's gonna pack more punch because of the, the high geranial or specific oils, then uh, that's economical for the brewer, right? So um, that's, that's cool to hear that you can just use a little bit and it goes a long way. <laughs> And then it looks like there's a, a question in the Q&A that I'm actually kind of interested in from your side of it, which is um, there's hops that are harvested early and hops that are harvested late. And like what would be the effects of late harvesting and early hop? Um, is, that, is that a huge sensory difference or is that more just like logistics on the field? Good question. There's definitely a lot of uh, studies designed around harvest uh, window, but typically you can monitor, I mean, uh, genetically hops are just going to actually mature at different times. Uh, so there are early varieties that will always mature at the beginning of September, end of August right there. And then some, because once they hit, they'll hit like a peak alpha and oil production, they'll start to dry out a little bit and then you'll pick them and then kill them. Um, if you let them go past that, they're going to over dry and be really shattery once you try to pick them. They'll blow off in the picking machine and your yield will go way down. Um, and you'll probably lose some of those uh, nice aroma characteristics uh, just from degradation out in the field. Um, they can kind of go overripe and turn into sometimes some um, unpleasant aromas like on onion garlic if it's not true to the type. Um, and then there are, you know, obviously late harvested varieties that are just taking a long time to mature. Um, and uh, you just want to, you want to pick it, each variety has its own picking window, um, and you wouldn't want to push it too far one direction, because uh, you will impact the pickability, the yield, um, and probably the, the sensory characteristics as well. Um, so we're always monitoring them and making sure that we're targeting the right, you know, and every grower is informed of the picking window before they, they start growing a hop variety, so they should know uh, to time things out because 
you can't, if everything matures at once, you're gonna have a really hard time picking the highest quality hops. Uh, the kiln's gonna be that bottleneck. Um, so we have to work with our uh, procurement team to kind of uh, talk to a bunch of different growers and make sure that um, everyone is spaced out and has you know, varieties that they can pick over the whole month uh, so that they're using the kilns and their equipment to the, to the best of their ability and to their full capacity. Um, so I don't know if that was, was there any more to that question? I think <laughs> you so. nailed it. All right. Well, I think we saw a good response on Talus. So let's move to our final sample, which is Idaho 7. Okay, is this your first hop sample? <laughs> Getting really excited, flinging hops around. Getting real green in the hands. Oh, no. <laughs> broke the Bad seal. Down, man. Yeah. We've got about eight tasters that have submitted. How's it smelling over at Single Hill? Can you, you smell anything good. after all your sneezes? I, I sniff it up. <laughs> You're supposed to snort it. <laughs> I'm sniffing gently. It just messes with the side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, I like this hop a lot. Uh, I don't, we haven't used it in a ton. Um, we've used it in combinations a couple of times, but like, I always find it really interesting every time we come back to it. I'm going to like hold off on saying why until more people have submitted their things because I don't want to lead anybody, but like. Yes, appreciate that. Really pleasant. I know Tiffany said something similar of Talus, but Idaho 7 is another one that just um, is so consistent during harvest. Like. It's just so rare to um, smell an Idaho 7 that it's like not uh, exactly what we want it to be, basically. Uh, definitely another one that jumps off the table pretty consistently. This is another, this is actually a late harvested variety. It can sometimes be the last variety that a grower will pull down. So even after a lot of the high alphas, um, but it, yeah, it doesn't really cross over with um, the other picking windows, which is really nice. and. Um, you know, at the end of the year, the high alphas are all like pretty onion garlicky and really resinous and intense. And so then to have an Idaho 7 come down alongside is, is kind of fun as well. So let's see where we're at on the count. 
Yeah, my dream of the Idaho Gem Idaho Seven Fresh Hop beer is kind of crushed by Idaho Gem being harvested like first and Idaho Seven being last. But one of these days we'll figure it out. <laughs> Maybe with the frozen fresh hops, we can make that dream a reality someday. Oh yeah, that would be cool. All right, we got twenty tasters, so why don't you spill the beans? Yeah. What do you what do you smell? Those are my um just a ton of tropical ton of tropical notes um i do just the slightest bit of like kind of onion garlic but it doesn't necessarily denote a bad thing for me um oh excuse me yeah i i i think i was kind of hands i'm blown away with i don't get any citrus like at all um, with this huge, huge fruit punch sort of thing going on that is really, really unique. Uh, not so unique, but like helps, helps us work on some of these like newer style IPAs that move away from like the traditional everything's grapefruit pine forever situation. Yeah, I think one of our key descriptors for this one tends to be pineapple and just like smells like pineapple and then it tastes like pineapple in beer. Um, I always get like a purple grape aroma too, but I don't yeah, know if people totally. <laughs> agree with me or not. Yeah, I definitely see grape. But kind of That's a delightful. That. Um, <laughs> Say again, Tristan. Also found that it adds like a, a particularly like grapefruit pithy bitterness um to our beers which is like it's actually a really it's a really like lovely bitterness um when added to the dry hop um amongst all the other tropical and berry flavor contributions to the, to the final beer big fan at single hill yeah i'm a pretty big fan myself i did get a bit of that um kind of garlicky aroma right at first but it's completely flashed off and now i'm not getting it anymore at all Awesome. Well, I think that concludes the interactive portion. Let's see what we have. These are some resources uh, that you can use to find out different methods for assessing hops, read some research articles. I highly suggest checking them out. Um, and you can always contact us as well. We're happy to answer any questions. Um, you know, we can bounce back some bounce back and forth some ideas about how to train new panelists. Um, if you want some of those exercises, uh, things to do, some reference standard cues, um, we can definitely share those resources with you. And and be sure we do post a lot of our stuff on on the website, and and more stuff will be added soon. So be sure to go there, and then also feel free to contact either one of us uh, if you have questions. And Tiffany and Tessa, we've got a question in the okay. Q and A. Um, section do you all have a sense of better or worse vintages for different hop varieties i know year after year we speculate on the quality of certain varieties based on subjective memory do you all have an objective sensory sense of this and does it feed into farming practices okay we were definitely changing our screen a little bit yeah sorry can you read just the first half run that bias one more time absolutely do you all have a sense of better or worse vintages for different hop varieties Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, it's kind of different from wine, you know, I think, um, and yet it, being also an agricultural product like grapes, of course, they're subject to annual variation just based on things like the weather patterns and, uh, you know, that's the main one really. Um, where, and in wine, I feel like, you know, each vintage being different is really celebrated. That's you know, a huge part of wine, you wouldn't want every vintage to be identical. Um, but because hops have to feed into, you know, another product, um, oftentimes, you know, flagship products that breweries uh, are trying to make as similar as possible every year. Um, I think that, you know, it's a slightly different um, proposition, you know, there's still going to be year to year variation, but we, we do everything we can to make them as consistent as possible for that reason. 
Yeah, and I mean, there are always going to be um, some challenges that independent individual growers might face, um, but we try to work really hard with our growers. We're a grower owned company, so providing them with as much information on, you know, when to harvest things, uh, what kiln temperature to use, um, how to correct for um, some, some issues that might come up during the growing season. Um, but we're also assessing every single lot as it comes in and we're able to kind of, um, you know, correct on our end as well. We're going to reject stuff that's not performing well um, and that can be a tough decision, but to make sure that we're starting out with the best product possible. And then as we go into production, we often um, blend lots together and that's actually to kind of get back to that true to type. Um, so we're always looking to find that, that middle, well, a little bit better than middle, um, I guess, but, but really blending lots together to make sure that we're giving like the best version of Idaho 7 out into a group run. So um, that's something that I know our sensory data is used to kind of make sure that we have a more consistent product for year to year, um, even with all those agricultural variables that pop up. Um, so obviously way more work to be done. There are so many things to consider, but um, hopefully by arming our production team with all that data, they're able to, to blend to true to tightness. The next question, I know we talked about this a little bit earlier, but maybe we could revisit. Um, can you talk about off flavors from hops pick too early versus too late? Yeah, um, and it's all dependent on the, the variety. So, um, you know, for an earlier variety, if you pick it too early, sometimes the oils haven't really fully developed um, and you'll actually just get really vegetal, grassy, green <laughs> aromas. Um, so you won't get, if you expect citrus or spicy, um, some aromas like that, they might not have, have developed yet. And so um, if you're picking that too early, that can happen. Um, again, if you let it turn and it, it's on the on the vine for too long, it can go a little bit more like burnt rubber, um, yeah, onion garlic, you know, our onion garlic is true to type in some varieties. So we always consider that as well, but in, you know, a nice aroma hop that's a little bit lower alpha, we wouldn't expect to be getting like an intense onion garlic aroma. Um, a lot of things that happen off notes that occur in hops happen after. So, you know, if they haven't been, if they've been over dried, I mentioned you'll get that cheesy, sweaty socks um, from oxidized um, lupulin. If you get those musty, mildewy ones, that's from being under dried and compressed into a bale, it might start, actually start to compost. So, you should be getting kind of those swampy, <laughs> composty, gross, wet aromas. Um, and I'm trying to think of what other ones. Um, you know, smoke can happen from atmospheric smoke. Um, those are kind of the key ones that we train on, but it's not all about the pick window, I guess. There's a lot to the process. Um, and so we have to train our panelists on, on all of those so that we're able to pick up on them and, and deal with the hops accordingly. The next question is asking about the current fires and if that will affect selection this year. Can you talk a little bit about the sensory panels um, role in, in that? Oh, of course that question is coming up, right? <laughs> um, well, so I would say the selection is a little bit more impacted by COVID this year because we can't host as many people, um, but there is an active wildfire very close by and uh, we do have air quality meters um, outside and we actually have a purifier in our panel room, um, but our team is fully prepared to still assess every single hop lot as it's delivered to us. And if we detect any smoke taint, uh, we will flag it and uh, you know, try to remediate as much as possible. Um, check it again through storage, uh, check it again after production or not actually sell that lot. So um, we've trained, we actually have a smoke taint training tomorrow with the panel to really dive deeper into that, um, to make sure everyone is fully aware of how it can present itself in different hop varieties so that they can identify it and report it consistently if they do detect it in a sample. Um, and yeah, from our end, we're just trying to make sure that we provide a very smoke-free environment that they can assess their hops so we're not getting fatigued or blind to those specific aromas. And uh, we don't know what the year holds, but we're hoping it's fine. <laughs> we're certainly a lot more prepared this year than we were last year when the first, um, you know, when it, we first started seeing the occasional smoke-impacted hop we had no one had ever like discussed what, you know, we had no protocols developed. Um, 
we worked really hard to develop them on the fly, but this year I feel like we are really uh, quite a bit more prepared to deal with it. So um, that's the silver lining, I guess. And then, you know, once you're actually prepared to deal with something, uh, then it won't happen, right? Right? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> I'm right, I'm sure I'm right. <laughs> And the next question is about, can you talk about uh, diesel aromas? Uh, should I pull out our standard? <laughs> no, we just love it. Yeah. Oh, we've got a real doozy of a standard for diesel. Diesel is on our ballot. Um, you know, we can't uh, bring in like a can of diesel into like the lab and have people give it a whiff. So what we did find though, because we're very creative and very good at problem solving is this lovely candle NASCAR brand candle. Uh, NASCAR brand candle. I can't even think of it. Which is diesel scented. <laughs> yeah. And it's it smells like a garage. <sighs> I mean, I kind of like it. I don't know. I, I don't think I'd burn this in my house, but it does smell like diesel. Uh, so they wanted us to talk about it. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> could come from how people are processing the fuel that they're using. I think most growers are pretty conscientious and you shouldn't detect this from an actual like any diesel getting in the hops at all um, but sometimes it can be associated with that over ripeness as well so kind of that burnt rubber uh diesel -y, I mean garlic like, kind of all live in that same area so um we will pick up on that usually it's not quite as strong as, as this it might just be a hint but um I don't really know how much more to say <laughs> diesel diesel I can send you a link to this uh, reference standard if you'd like, just shoot us an email. <laughs> so Eric asked, I received a cryo hop sample, try 2304 with the other samples. Can you describe more about this hop? Oh, I didn't know that one out. <laughs> that's awesome. Did everyone get that? Um, so that, that's been rebranded as uh, cryo pop. So um, we have a whole website dedicated to uh, the launch of that. Is that still active? The CrowdPop? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. so um, that is going to be a blend of different hop varieties um, that the blend was designed to target um, what we're calling uh, survivable compounds. So compounds that are present in hops that actually um, make it into final beer. Um, the brewing process is really tumultuous. There's a lot of um, boiling and settling and uh, a lot of the compounds that you're smelling when you're assessing a raw hop are actually um, going to be lost because they're maybe not that soluble in the beer matrix or they you know volatilize or whatever um, so the, our R&D lab has done a lot of um, chemical analysis on these things and has identified sort of a handful of, of compounds um, that we think are pretty key in transferring flavor from hops into beer so that blend was actually designed um, but uh, to, to maximize those survivable compounds by blending the lots that um, we had identified as being highest in those compounds. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Tiffany and Tessa. Those are all the questions that we currently have in the Q&A section. Um, really appreciate everyone joining on for this hop sensory training session today. And we will see you at our next hop and brew school session at noon. Um, thank you all for joining. Thanks Thank so much. You. Thanks, friends at Single Hill. <laughs>